Now, what you're contemplating here is divorce. One big divorce. Now, divorce is never amicable. I'm sure none of you have been divorced. But I have, and more than once. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you it's never amicable. You can make a deal over the CDs, the DVDs, the Dutch, maybe even the car, maybe even the house. But you never make a deal in which the person walking out the door when you're begging them to stay allows you to continue to use the joint credit card. That's never been done. Nobody says to the wife or the husband that's walking out on them, by the way, you can continue to use our joint credit card. And yet that exactly is what Alex Salmon's plan for breaking up the country depends on. It's incredible. He has no plan B. His entire plan was based on the remaining British government, whoever forms it, allowing a foreign country to continue to use its currency. And before people say we've got our own notes and we use pounds and so on, it's not the person who uses the currency that owns it. It's the person who issues it. And the clue is in the name. The pound sterling is issued by the Bank of England. And Simon's plan to have a separate foreign country control our tax our interest rates, our monetary fiscal policy, for that's what that plan means, is actually the very opposite of independence. It's less independent than you are now because it involves withdrawing from Westminster all the Scottish MPs, all Scottish influence on decision making, whilst allowing the country we're withdrawing from to control everything about our financial and monetary and taxation affairs. That would put us in exactly the relationship experienced by only one country in the world, Panama, which has that relationship to the United States of America. And Panama, by strange coincidence, was Scotland's first colony. The person who founded that colony, which beggared half of the people in Scotland, I'm not joking, 50% of the people of Scotland were beggared, ruined by the Darien expedition, is the same man that founded the Bank of England. How's that <laughs> for coincidence? Panama today uses the US dollar, that's its currency but it doesn't send senators or congressmen or women to the United States Congress. It's entirely dependent upon the United States and has no independent existence, economically speaking. That's what you'd be doing if you agreed to Alex Salmon's plan. But it's worse than that because the British remaining political parties have told us in no uncertain terms and absolutely unequivocally will not be allowed to use the pound for the reason I just implied. To allow somebody else to use your currency when you have no idea what they'll do with it, you have no idea whether they'll cause a run on it, they have no reserves with which to defend it, would be the equivalent of allowing somebody else who walked out on you to use their credit card, and they will not do it. Now, Salmon thinks that when the governor of the Bank of England says no, when the potential chancellors of the Exchequer, any of them, say no, that you can just belly that away. Say you're bluffing. I don't believe you. But I'm here to tell you, and Pamela is too, the talk in Westminster is not about bluffing, it's absolutely certain. So you are the only country in the world 
being asked to decide to become a separate country in just a few days' time when you don't have a currency. What are you going to use for a currency? What are you going to pay pensions and wages in? How are you going to pay bills? There's no answer to that. If Salmon had any courage, he would have said from the beginning, we're going to be a separate currency and we're going to use the euro. How's that going? The euro. That's why he didn't say that, because he knew that the number of takers for the euro, given what's happened over these last few years, would be precious few. So if not the euro and not the pound, what's it going to be? has to be a new currency that we invent or perhaps resurrect. Maybe it'll be the groat. And do you remember the groat? I know nobody in here can actually remember the groat, but you'll know that we once had the groat. We could bring it back. Cracking my own wife's walking out. <laughs> we could bring back the groat, but what's it going to be worth? And what's it going to be based on? And who's going to lend to it a new currency with no reserves and no history? There is a precedent. Let me tell you about it. In Czechoslovakia, as was, the Czechs wanted the Slovaks to stay. But the Slovaks wanted to go. And the Czechs said, well, if you go, you can't use our currency for the reasons I have just been explaining. So the Slovaks made up their own currency and it lasted precisely 31 days. The currency collapsed in 31 days and the IMF and the World Bank had to move in and entirely restructure everything, beggaring millions of working people in Slovakia. And now, as it happens, the Czech Republic is one of the most happening places in Europe. People travel to Prague from all over the world. It's a swinging, sexy, young, new country, but nobody's going to Slovakia. In fact, most of the Slovakians are trying to leave. And some of them, many of them, already have. So, you have to ask yourself, are you going to mortgage your children and their children's future? I mean, I'm a, the oil is going to last 30 years. <coughs> According to Mr. Woods, which is his first name, Sir, Sir Ian Wood, one of the world's experts on oil, in his statement this week, or the beginning of last week, he was very clear. He could not remain silent whilst Alex Salmond oversold both the value of the oil and above all, the length of time that it will last. And here's what he said. You can check it if you don't believe me. He said the oil production from the North Sea will sharply reduce, sharply reduce in 20 years and will be entirely finished in 30. After which, by the way, you'll have to cap every oil well in the North Sea. And the cost of capping it across 5 million people is by definition 12 times more expensive than capping it across 60 or 65 million people in Great Britain as a whole. Now, I'll be very lucky if I'm here in 20 years. I'll almost certainly not be here in 30 years. But some of you, <laughs> thanks here, are very long. But some of you will be here. Pamela will be here. And God save them. All of our children will still be here in 20 years, in 30 years, when the oil runs out. And what is it then? Is it back to the short breed exports? Going to export. The Alexander Brothers back catalog. <laughs> now, this is deadly serious. I apologize for spending all this time on 
economics, which I know is not everybody's cup of tea, but Scottish people are quite canny people. They're famous for it. Really famous for counting the pennies, knowing how hard a penny is to earn and how it has to be looked after. I'm here to tell you you'd be really stupid if you decided to go down that road. And I hope that you will not. I want to move on to the political case. Because I hear people all the time saying, we've got to break up the country because we've got to get rid of the Tories. Well, they didn't vote for the Tories in Bradford, or in Newcastle, or in Liverpool, or in Birmingham, or in London. Are we going to walk out and leave them to the Tories? Well, even if that doesn't strike you as an immoral thing, it does to me, Scots to the lifeboats, the boat's going to crash, only Scots get on the lifeboats. It's immoral to me. But even if you don't agree that it's immoral, what is the only conceivable outcome of taking 99% of the Scottish MPs out of Westminster who are not Tories is to give the Tories 49 MPs of a start in every subsequent general election. I mean no disrespect, but I don't think that Ed Miliband can win elections giving the Tories 49 seats of a start. So what does that mean? <clears throat> that means that your neighbour, with a population of 60 million people, will have virtually permanent Tory rule. Hard luck for them, you might say. But actually, the hard luck is on you. Because that right-wing, Thatcherite government, in perpetuity perhaps, will legislate to create a low regulation, low taxation, low public expenditure, right-wing Tory paradise. In which case, which capitalists do you know are going to choose to come and locate in Alex Salmon, Scotland, which he's telling us is going to be a Scandinavian social democracy. Do you know any capitalists that would prefer to locate in a low tax, or a rather a high tax environment, rather than a low tax environment, with high levels of regulation rather than low levels? I've never met such a capitalist. In which case, the Scottish government will have to follow suit. And Alex Salmond has got his retaliation in first. The one promise in the White Paper, one, on these matters, is to cut profit tax for companies by 3%. But if he did that, the right-wing government left in London would cut profit tax by 4%. Then Salmond would have to cut it by 5%, and so on, before long, we'd be paying the companies to come and locate here.